understanding where packaging makes a big contribution, particularly in physical availability, is important. Helping a brand stand out in shopping environments, I think, is one of the biggest roles of a pack. You can have an award-winning campaign, but if you don't have the physical availability in place, and part of that is being able to be found in shopping environments. So you have to have the right package design that clearly communicates the brand, its distinctive assets, and then it's about how that is used. Those two things coming together of the designers feeding in to give the right ingredients, but then the marketers making sure they use the package well to make the most of the right ingredients. Packaging design should seduce, inform, and even save the planet. I'm Hernan Raberman, and this is Branderman, the podcast where I talk with experts to uncover what it actually takes to make a positive impact on consumers, the market, and society. Warning, keep this podcast out of the reach of close-minded marketers and designers. Before the interview, Let me introduce my design agency. Brands with purpose. Human, agile, honest brands that leave no one indifferent. Tridimage creates and revitalizes brands to imagine and shape the future. Tridimage, the branding and packaging design agency for bold brands. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking for the second time with Jenny Romanuk, a research professor and associate director at the Eremer Bass Institute, who is a trailblazer in distinctive assets and mental availability strategy and measurement. Jenny has provided advice to companies all around the world on evidence-based best practices for long-term brand management. She's the accomplished author of three books, Building Distinctive Brand Assets, How Brands Grow Part 2, and Better Brand Health. In this episode, we dive deep into the concept of brand health trackers and we explore the anatomy of a healthy brand. Additionally, we discuss the significance of packaging in building and refreshing memory structures, as well as its potential to convey shopping distinctive assets. Today with me, Jenny Romanuk. Jenny, if you had to wear your own warning label on your forehead to warn others of your dangers, what would you wear? I think I would probably wear, beware has strong but not fixed opinions. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that often I will have an opinion on something and then I might hear, you know, someone might disagree with me and I'll be like, no, 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 you can't be right. But then I'll think about it. And I think about it afterwards. And, you know, three days later, I might message them and say, you know, I thought about what you said. And actually, you were right. I've changed my mind on that. So my immediate reaction, like most people's, when you hear something that's contrary to what you believe is to dismiss it. But I don't ignore it. And I do mm -hmm. think about it. So I can change my opinion. But that doesn't negate it being strong. I think one of the things I've been working on as I'm getting older is the ability to not have an opinion and to sometimes go, you know, I actually don't need to have a strong opinion about that. That's something that I've been cultivating as I get wiser. <laughs> and even when you start a research from scratch, a new project, how do you face it? Yeah, I mean, key challenge, I think, is to keep your thinking and your perspective fresh. So each year I try to set myself a challenge with learning like a new type of data or a new approach or something that makes me get out of my comfort zone and try something new, and basically to get that beginner's mindset hmm. so that I'm always approaching things with something fresh to the table rather than getting ingrained in the same techniques and the same approaches. Sure. What are the best and the most difficult parts of being a research professor within the world's largest center for research into marketing? 
Ah, well, the best parts are, particularly being a part of a research institute, is I have lots of smart people around me who are also doing amazing work that inspire me and make me look at things in different ways because they will tackle their own problems in a way and I'll see parallels and think about things that I can do or collaborate with them. Biggest drawbacks always is when you have big organizations, you have bureaucracy. So (laughs) administration is my downfall. (laughs) So I'm constantly not filling out the right forms or not filling out the forms in the right way or not haven't reconciled my credit card or something like that where (laughs) someone's messaging me that I'm in trouble about something. What is your favorite current professional habit? I think probably I love listening to podcasts, which is, you know, I'm talking to you (laughs) now, on, but I do actually really learn a lot from podcasts because I find they're a way to sort of Just hear perspectives because, you know, when you're listening to a podcast of two people talking, it's like you're listening to an interesting conversation on the table over from you. You're not required to participate. So you can drift in and out as you want. Rather than reading where you've got to focus a lot more, I find that podcasts are an interesting way to get different perspectives on things. Yeah. So let's start with an easy question, Jenny. Why do people need brands? Because they're very useful. So if you think of brands as just basically stored information about stuff in our memories, the reason we store information about stuff in our memories is so that we can draw and learn from the past to make the current and the future easier. By storing knowledge about brands in our brain, they make our future purchases usually pretty easier. And so that means we can focus on other things rather than the actual buying process of brands. What is for you the good part and evil part of brands? I think brands are just really tools that we use to make our life easier. I don't know that there is necessarily an evil side of brands. I think sometimes people who work in with brands take them a bit too seriously. And so it's more, you kind of go, really? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's maybe a bit pompous sometimes when people are talking about brands and that they are somehow saving the world. And (laughs) it's like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think brands have a really important role to play in developing the economy and making us wealthier, but they're not going to cause world peace. Branding appears to be an imprecise and complex process. Is there a compass to navigate the turbulent waters of brand building? The reason why it maybe appears complex and difficult is because there is a creative element to it. Mm. We've often likened it to building a bridge, say. If you're building a bridge, there are two dimensions to it. There's the science that you need to make sure that you build it with the right materials, with the right tensile, so that it will stay up and it will hold the loads that it's likely to, et cetera. And then there are the creative aspects to it, which was how does it look? What is its aesthetic design? With branding, it's the same sort of thing. There's the science that tells us this is how brands grow, this is what you need to develop. But then there's still the creative element of how you do it, that allows you to have some freedom to both knock it out of the park and do a fabulous job, but also to fail miserably as well. (laughs) Why do you avoid using the term consumers and prefer to talk about category buyers? Because they're not often, they're sometimes not the same people. And if you think about branding as influencing choice and generating revenue, it's the buyers that choose and pay. That's who I'm most interested in. Now, the opinions of people who consume but don't buy are only useful to the extent that the buyer knows that and holds that in their memory. So it's the buyer's brain I'm most interested in and the consumer's brain as a secondary. Which brand's memories are useful for buyers and how can package help create and cement that memories? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably illustrate what's useful by giving an example of something that's not. 
I backpacked through Central America after uni and I ended up in um, Tegucigalpa in Honduras. Yep. And at that point, I'd had basically Mexican food and I was just really craving a nice salad. And there was a pizza hut there. First pizza hut I'd seen in up 10 weeks because we'd been through Mexico, Guatemala, and sort of stuff. So I'd have an association of a pizza hut of Tegucigalpa. Now, that's not useful at all for pizza hut marketers because that's a very unique personal association to <laughs> me. And so they're not going to send an ad going, hey, if ever in Tegucigalpa, go to the pizza hut for a salad bar. <laughs> So we all have memories about brands that are personal, that are individual, that are not very useful. But there are other memories that are more common, ubiquitous, and also that are relevant next time when we're in buying situations. And so there are three basic types of these. One we call category entry points, which are the thoughts that people have before they're about to buy that shape the options that are likely to be memorable at that time. We have core competencies. So these are things like being trustworthy and reliable, whereby we're not looking to maximize them. You don't buy the brand that is the most reliable or the most trustworthy. But if you have doubts about them, then you might cross a brand off the list. So okay. if you're not sure if it's going to do a good job and there are others where you are confident they will do a good job, you know, the one that you're not sure about, there's just no need to take that risk, so you'll just get rid of it. And then third active assets, which are the non-brand name elements that are linked to the brand that you want to trigger the brand. And that's where particularly packaging comes in because they are often one of the major vehicles that communicate those distinctive assets. What inspired you to write a book about brand health? What impact would you like that book to have? I'd like it to just generally lift the quality of brand health data everywhere uh, because I think there are some fundamental errors that are being made with the best of intent, but they're just not helping our data quality. Poor data quality damages everybody. It, it damages organizations that are collecting the data because they don't get the quality insights. But it also damages R&D as well because we can't learn from that. I'd had lots of conversations with people expressing their frustration about what they were getting from their brand health tracker. And I also felt like I was in a unique position because when we first started out, we actually did run brand health trackers for some organizations. I was quite frustrated with our lack of knowledge of different areas of even the most basic areas of, you know, why do brand awareness scores shift and who actually is causing those shifts. So over about a decade, I got different researchers to research parts of the tracker okay. that gave us a lovely holistic view that fed into the book. So I felt it really needed to be brought together into one place as a resource. Great. What's the anatomy underneath a healthy brand? I would say that it has strong mental and physical availability. Mental availability is about being easily thought of, and that involves having a strong media plan that aims for reach and continuity, having good quality branding in all your communications, so that's good use of the brand name and strong distinctive assets, And building useful memories, which is where category entry points come in. And then we have physical availability, which is about being easy to find and buy. And that involves having the channel management scale that you are covering as many purchases as possible. So you are where buying is happening as much as possible with as few options as possible. So you're not wasting resources being prominent in those locations so you're easily found and having the right portfolio mix so that you're covering the sales now but also future-proofing the brand as well. That's great. The subtitle of your book is Measures and Metrics for a How Brands Grow World. Can you briefly describe how that world looks like? 
How Brands Grow World acknowledges that brands grow by expanding their customer base. And so once you understand that and take that on board, you realize, okay, so if I grow in the next year, there's a whole heap of people who didn't buy me this year that will buy me next year. So that then highlights the importance of brands' non-buyers. How do I understand what's going on in their brains? Because something's going to change that makes them from not being a brand buyer to being a brand buyer. So how do I pick that up? And so that then changes the focus of who you're tracking and what sort of metrics you're looking for. How Brands Grow World also acknowledges that no matter what sort of brand you are, your biggest competitors will be the biggest brands in the category. And so often brands will pay more attention to lookalikes to them that offer similar ranges and things. And that can be a distraction because we know from something like the duplication of purchase law, if you grow, you will gain more customers from the bigger brands and fewer customers from the smaller brands as a normal course of it. So if you understand the laws of growth, it does actually reshape how you look at your marketing, but also how you look at your metrics to assess the performance of those marketing as well. Why do you consider that a good brand health tracker has a foot in the past and an eye in the future? Because not every brand starts at the same point. If you're a big brand, you have a lot of people who have current experience with you and with past experience. So you should score higher on everything. If you're a small brand, you have fewer people who know you at all, have direct experience with you, and so you will score less. We need to acknowledge the different starting points of brands if we're going to assess the performance of anything that we've done. The foot in the past refers to two things. One is trackers should help assess how our past activities worked, but also trackers should acknowledge the past in that creates our expectations for what sort of metrics a brand or a buyer should have or provide. So the eye on the future is you don't want your instrument to just be a historical record. You also want it to give you insight into what do we need to do to change, improve in the future, or what should we keep doing because it's working. So it needs to have both of those dimensions in it to work properly as something you would invest in as a resource if you're a brand manager. What are some signs to detect that a brand is losing its health or perhaps experiencing an illness? Yeah, that's a good question. We can't assume that what makes a brand grow, the absence of it is what causes a brand to decline. Brands mm. can decline in a different way to what they grow. It doesn't have to be the same route down as what you took up. So if you've ever climbed a mountain, I was lucky enough to climb Kilimanjaro. Yeah. And you don't go back down the same way you came up. <laughs> you go up one way and you come down the other side. And it's different terrain and different topography. So that's the one thing we have to realize is that the indicators of decline may be different to the indicators of growth. Interesting. Why do you consider that a good brand health tracker should be a window into the mind of the category buyer? And even you use the name category buyer mindset tracker instead of the usual brand health tracker denomination. One of the things that puzzled me when I first started working with brand health trackers is I went, hmm, I know this is for the brand, but it shouldn't be about the brand. It should be about the buyer we're trying to influence. Referring to it as a brand health tracker, that meant there were lots of questions about brands in there. And I went, mm. like, they're missing the point. <laughs> it's actually people that buy, not brands. They buy brands, but brands don't actually do anything in themselves. Um, so that was partly what led to the research into things like category entry points was this acknowledgement that a lot of brand attribute lists were all about brands and very little about the buyers buying those brands. And a lot of those category entry points were actually in other research that the company did, but they just didn't come into the brand health tracker because that was the domain of the brand. 
We see what people buy because, you know, your yep. bottom line tells you, yeah, you know, <laughs> this person bought my brand and this person didn't and this many people bought my brand. But what we don't see in that behavior is that the actual battle to get bought happened in the buyer's mind. And so the brand health tracker is our only opportunity to really see have we basically armed ourselves well enough to give a good showing and hopefully win that battle in people's minds? To me, it's the only avenue we have to do that, to understand why things happened and to set ourselves up for it happening rather than just go, oh, well, that's what happened and that is good or bad, but not have any insights into why we got into that situation. Brand tracking enables business to understand how their brand building initiatives are performing. It's a measure of how healthy their brand is. Design for the category, analyze for the buyer, report for the brand. Can you tell us a bit about that mantra? This comes out of applying the laws of growth to brand health tracking. Uh, well, the laws of growth plus our understanding of how memory works. Design for the category just means that one of the things that holds trackers back is people unintentionally or sometimes intentionally skew or bias it to their own brand circumstance. Whereas you should be designing for the category. You should have a tracker that any brand manager in your category would look at and go, yeah, I'd use this. This is good. Mm. So if you're a small brand, you should have a tracker that a big brand would still use. If you're a big brand, you should have a tracker that a small brand would still use. And if you don't, then that's only giving you a biased perspective on the world. So if you're a big brand and you have a big brand design tracker, how is it going to help you understand a small brand that's growing really rapidly? You're not going to because you've got a big brand tracker. Ditto, if you're a small brand and you go, well, no, my competitors are these other small brands and I'm going to, you know, just going to pretty much ignore the big brands. They're not my real competitors. Then how are you going to get big? How are you going to notice when someone who the biggest brand in the category does things that's going to have a big impact on you? How are you going to pick that up? Analyzing for the buyer, it's really interesting. Marketers will often ask for Cuts of the data by age, by gender, by location. Most of those differences that they see are just variations in how many brand users and non-users you have. Because that's the real difference in someone giving a response, whether or not they have direct past experience with the brand or if they don't. If you have direct past experience, you're pretty much more likely to give higher or more positive responses for everything. And so, you know, when you're analyzing, you need to take that into account that not all people are at the same starting point for the brand. And then reporting for the brand is drawn from things like Double Jeopardy, where we know that the loyalty scores for big brands are different to the loyalty scores for small brands mm -hmm. systematically. So Double Jeopardy is that small brands are penalized twice. They have many fewer users who are slightly less loyal. And so your benchmark for loyalty as a small brand is different from your benchmark for loyalty as a big brand. Well, that same thinking carries through to a lot of our brand health metrics as well. We need to control for brand size to fully understand our performance on a metric. Otherwise, we risk as small brands going, oh, well, <laughs> well, we don't have the loyalty of a bigger brand, so we mustn't be doing anything right, when you might actually be overperforming for a brand of your size. And if you're a big brand, it can lead you to be fat and complacent there because you think, oh, we're doing the best <laughs> on everything. Isn't that great? When actually you're underperforming for a brand of your size. So when you bring all those three things together, that's what helps in terms of a mindset of designing the tracker and its analysis and reporting gets you more robust results. Do you think that package design can help to increase brand awareness? I think it's hard to. 
And the reason for that is that we know from shopping studies, and this is both online and in store, people have blinkers on and they don't notice anything. So if you're a brand that no one knows about, the chance of someone stumbling across you in a store is low. The chance of someone stumbling across you online is even lower. So that's really hard. But where packaging can help is if it's employed in advertising so that you build up the memory structures before someone is in a shopping environment, then that can make activities within the shopping environment more impactful because people already have it in their brain. What kind of brand attributes are better communicated through package design? When I talk think about brand attributes, I think about what are the memories you want to build in someone's brain. Out of the ones I talked about, packaging are particularly good for conveying what I call shopping distinctive assets. And they are the things that our buyers use to quickly find brands in shopping environments. That's where I think packaging is at its best, is when it can really simply and clearly convey those distinctive assets. Now, can a packaging do more than that and convey other associations? I don't know. The danger if you try to get something to do too much when it comes to building memories, it does nothing. It just becomes too complicated. Packaging is best used to refresh memory structures rather than build them. The work to build them is done in a less cluttered environment, and that can be during advertising, social media, whatever. So that then when someone's in a shopping environment, it's about accessing and refreshing those memories rather than trying to build and use at the same time. But what about, for example, if you want to influence the taste grade attribute and you design an eye-catching photograph that triggers appetite appeal, that wouldn't be a good use of the package in terms of affecting that brand attribute? Uh, something like tastes great, it depends on the degree to which that's actually a category entry point versus a hygiene factor, a core competency. So if it's a core competency, I wouldn't spend my energy communicating it because there's always a bit of a risk that, you know, if a brand has to say, we are the brand that tastes great, it'd be like, well, yeah, I assumed you would. What, you not? There's a doubt. Someone doubted that you would taste great. So you have to tell me you taste great. So there's always a risk with core competencies that the more you say it, the more you actually create doubt about it. Now, there are some categories where taste is a is an element of it. What I loved is we did some category entry point research in China. And one of the things that came out of that was this phrase that was translated that said, when my mouth is lonely. <laughs> and I'm like, that's weird. And, I, yeah. you know, I, I, this has been translated by an agency. And I sort of looked at it and we had a native Chinese speaker at the Institute. And I said to her, I said, is this being mistranslated? What does this mean? She goes, no, it's actually a phrase in China. And it's, it's that when you have in your mouth that kind of empty feeling and you want something with a bit of flavor, they refer to it as my mouth is lonely. <laughs> I just love, I love that idea that yeah. my mouth is lonely. But what it means in terms of shaping items is you don't then, you know, get some water or something, you know, that or, or plain milk. You'd get, you know, a soft drink or a juice or something like that, something that's got flavor with it to fulfill that need. So there are times like that where taste and flavor is important and shapes the items that people are looking at. But that's not all categories, like, you know, bread, for example. I'm not sure that tasting great is one of the primary memory structures you would build if that was your category. So that's where I'd just be a bit careful about the degree to which packaging can perform strong on messaging and strong on branding. I'm not disputing it could. We know how hard it is to do that in an advertisement where we've got 30 seconds of people's time. If you look at packaging and how much time people spend absorbing and reading it, we have a very short window to communicate. Yeah. So that's where I think we just need more research in how do we do that well. Jenny, now I propose we play a brief game. 
As you know, a ping pong table is a must in many creative studios. I will make you a series of brief questions and you have to choose one or another concept. Are you ready for Brandersman ping pong? I am ready. <laughs> I'm a marketer or I am a researcher? Researcher, easily. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I love solving problems. I just happen to do them in the domain of marketing. A marketing conference or a branding conference? I think branding, just because I had so much fun on some branding conferences that we've had, because it's a narrower audience of really people interested in branding. But I would always go location over both. So oh, okay. it depends on where they are. <laughs> Qualitative or quantitative? Oh, I'm a quant girl, easily. I have a <laughs> lot of respect for qualitative research, and I do do some form of it, particularly in the category entry point stuff, but no, I'm a numbers girl at heart. <laughs> a quant girl is a good song title. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> Focus groups or gut feelings? I'm going to go neither here, <laughs> although I would go gut feeling over focus groups. I don't think focus groups are very effective tools for anything. <laughs> I'd go gut feeling, but only an informed gut feeling because the best gut feeling is when you've got all the inputs into your brain. If you don't know anything, your gut feeling will be rubbish. <laughs> If you know a lot, your gut feeling will be good. So you have to do the work to rely on gut feeling. With research, sometimes I do stuff and someone asks me, why am I doing it? And I go, you know, I actually don't know why. I just feel like I want to do this. Mm. Afterwards, I understand why. But at the time, I didn't know. But it was because my brain had put together all of these things and it kind of wasn't ready to tell me about it yet. <laughs> so it just said, just do this and then it will become clearer and then – I do it and then afterwards I go, ah, oh, yes, and this <laughs> brings together X, Y, and Z. But I can only do that because I knew about X, Y, and Z. If I didn't know them, it's not psychic power or prescience. It's <laughs> only making the most of that associative network we have in our brain. Conceptualization or execution? I would go conceptualization. I would always think before I do. <laughs> yeah. Package good research or durable good research? I don't think that they're different. And the reason for that is that, I mean, we were often sold this idea of fast moving consumer goods, which gave us the impression people were buying all the time. You know, there's a big chunk of people who only buy toilet cleaner once a year. Now, no disrespect to their toilets, I'm sure they're perfectly. <laughs> But, you know, there are people who buy a new phone every year. So the actual parallels between them are not that different. There's an overlap. It's just really about time. So I actually don't think they're very different. Research for a big established brand or for a niche emerging brand? Well, take a niche out of the equation because niche brands are not good because that means that they've got a deficit in penetration. Mm. And unless you can <laughs> that, they're probably not going to grow. But if it was a small brand versus a big brand, I don't know. I mean, I'm an Aussie and we're culturally ingrained to go for the underdog because we're a small country. So I probably would just by virtue go with a small brand. And I have done that where I've just worked with small brands just because I've liked that ability to do so, even though hello to all of my big brand corporate sponsors that we have at the Institute. I do love you a lot and very much enjoy working with you. And my heart is always, whenever I see a small brand growing, I just, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's a treat. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Leading researchers or continuing to research all your life? I hopefully don't have to choose in that I work with junior researchers who are starting out and love working with them because they bring a fresh perspective. But I'm going to continue researching all my life because that's my passion. The only way I can fuel it in others is by keeping that fire alive in me. <laughs> so I don't ever want to give up being a researcher myself. Remote work or face-to-face -face work? It depends. Face-to-face -face when you're working with people, because it's much easier when you're in a room with somebody. But sometimes you need quiet time to work yourself. I'm fortunate enough. I have a beautiful space I can work in at home. 
And so I do really good work here. But, you know, after talking to you, I'm going to go into the office, get to go to a series of meetings, and I'm really happy to talk to people there. Now, I could have technically probably done those meetings by Zoom as well, but it's nice to be in a room with people. It's nice to talk to people. I think if nothing else, the pandemic reminded us of that. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm a hybrid girl. <laughs> And finally, great market researchers are born or great market researchers are made? Great market researchers are made. There's two types of aspects of great research. One is the curiosity and the second is the execution. Curiosity is something that I think has to come internally and you have to cultivate it yourself. And I just noticed some people are just naturally curious. They want to know this. They want to know that. They bring ideas. If you're a curious person, you realize that out of 100 ideas you have, 98 of them will be absolute rubbish. <laughs> But two will be interesting. And of those, one of them might even be great. Some people have and some people have to work hard to cultivate it. But having the curiosity is not great if you don't execute it well. Having the question is only one part. Having the capacity to answer it is the other part, and that's where the execution comes in. The curiosity is often born but can be developed, but the execution is what's made because you have to learn that. You have to learn How do you do that? How do you look at data that way? What are the statistical tests I need? What are the drawbacks of everything that I'm doing so that I can make it stronger in the future? How do I get to be critical of my work but not self-defeating in the same process? Yeah. So all of those things are developed and so are made. <laughs> What would designers learn from reading your Better Brand Health book? First of all, how the brand fits into the whole ecosystem of measures and metrics. And I think from a designer perspective, because you're feeding into that in that whether the brands you work on succeed or fail is partly design, but also the execution, understanding how your role in that I think is really important and understanding the bigger picture. Mm. If designers want to interact well with marketers, I think the onus is on both sides to learn each other's language And understanding how marketers are judged and how brands are judged is part of learning that lexicon of effectiveness in marketing that allow them to have better conversations with marketers about how to build brands. Great. How can marketers use a health brand tracker to prescribe actions to improve a brand's package design? Understanding where packaging makes a big contribution, particularly in physical availability, is important. Helping a brand stand out in shopping environments, I think, is one of the biggest roles of a pack. It comes out in physical availability more, but it influences whether or not things like mental availability can do their best work. You can have an award-winning campaign, but if you don't have the physical availability in place, and part of that is being able to be found in shopping environments, it's not going to translate into sales and so won't be judged as well as what it could be. Hmm. So to me, packaging is a really important part of physical availability and the way that it's utilized in advertising helps it do that role well but it has to have the raw ingredients of right design first. So you have to have the right package design that clearly communicates the brand, its distinctive assets, as well as the other essential information, as well as protect the product, which is often the role of packaging. And then it's about how that is used and those two things coming together of the designers feeding in to give the right ingredients but then the marketers making sure they use the package well to make the most of the right ingredients. And I, so I, to me, it's not either or, it's these two teams working together. Right, yeah. We are facing a technological revolution in package research. Do you think the use of artificial intelligence will ever replace category buyers questionnaires? We looked at this for the book and the answer is no, not really mainly because artificial intelligence can only have a record at this stage of what we do online. And what we do online is only a small fraction of our lives. 
But there are so many buying decisions where I don't Google, I don't share with my friends, I don't actually explicitly put anything online that would tell you this. And so artificial intelligence is only as good as the input information. So because we're not inputting our brain to the web yet, no, I think we've got a long time. We're going to still have to be asking people questions to work out what's in their memories. <laughs> Jenny, if you could just take a pill and learn any subject, anything, what would it be? History. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, because I just think it's fascinating. So many things have happened in this world. One of the advantages of being in marketing for a while is you do start to see things repeating themselves. New names being given to old concepts. And it allows you to kind of go, oh, here we go again. The more we know history, the less we are doomed to repeat it. What is the most important thing on your to-do list for your professional life? What is your next adventure? We're doing our first ever mental and physical availability summits with our institute sponsors. It's an in-house event where we're showcasing a day of research that we're doing in the areas of mental and physical availability. It's a big adventure we're about to go on over the next couple of months. And then, you know, for me, there's a, a couple of areas that I'm still sort of feeling my way out. But yeah, I expect I will write another book. I'm just honing in on now what it is. So I'm not going to share what it is yet because I haven't <laughs> fully decided So yeah, I expect more books will be on the horizon as long as people keep buying them and people keep reading them. Jenny, thanks for this insightful talk and for your attributes, your attitude and mental availability during this episode. Muchas gracias. <laughs> It was a pleasure. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You can check the episode notes for all the relevant links. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram and on my website, branderman.design. Follow the podcast in your favorite app so you don't miss the next episode of Branderman, the podcast where we try to uncover how to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society through package design.